Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Monday, July 13th. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel man. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you have I learned from before my birth, you are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. I have been as important to many. But you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Our New Testament reading today is from Galatians chapter 2. Then, after fourteen years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission, even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seemed to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me, God knows shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to be circumcised worked also for me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James... He was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like a Jew? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. But if, in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, 
who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the wall, law, then Christ died for no purpose. Our reading tonight from the Book of Concord. I lost my bookmark. Our reading tonight from the Book of Concord is from the Small Called Articles, Part 3. It begins. We may be able to discuss the following articles with learned and reasonable people or among ourselves. The Pope and his government do not care much about these. With them, conscience is nothing but money, honors, and power are everything. Article 1. Sin. Here we must confess, as Paul says in Romans 5.12, that sin originated from one man, Adam. By his disobedience, all people were made sinners and became subject to death in the devil. This is called original, or the chief sin. The fruit of this sin are the evil deeds that are forbidden in the Ten Commandments. These include unbelief, false faith, idolatry, being without the fear of God, pride, despair, utter blindness, and in short, not knowing or regarding God. Also lying, abusing God's name, not praying, not calling on God, not regarding God's word, being disobedient to parents, murdering, being unchaste, stealing, deceiving, and such. This hereditary sin is such a deep corruption of nature that no reason can understand it. Rather, it must be believed from the revelation of Scripture. Therefore, it is nothing but error and blindness that the scholastic doctors have taught in regard to this article. Since Adam's fall, the natural power of human beings have remained whole and uncorrupted, and by nature people have a right reason and a good will, as the philosophers teach. A person has free will to do good and not to do evil, and, on the other hand, to not do good and do evil. By natural human powers, a person can observe and keep all God's commands. By natural human powers, a person can love God above all things and love his neighbor as himself. If a person does as much as is in him, God certainly grants him his grace. If a person wishes to go to the sacrament, there is no need of a good intention to do good. It is enough if a person does not have a wicked purpose to commit sin. So entirely good is human nature and so effective is the sacrament. Scripture does not teach that the Holy Spirit with his grace is necessary for a good work. These and many similar ideas have arisen from a lack of understanding and ignorance both about sin and about Christ our Savior. They are truly heathen teachings that we cannot endure. For if such teaching were true, then Christ has died in vain. A human being would have no defect or sin for which he would have died. Or he would have died only for the body, not for the soul, since the soul is sound and only the body is subject to death. Article 2. The Law Here we hold that the law was given by God first to restrain sin by threats and the dread of punishment, and by the promise and offer of grace and benefit. All this failed because of the evil that sin has worked in humanity. For by the law some people were made worse sinners, those who are hostile to the law because it forbids what they like to do and commands what they do not like to do. Wherever they can escape punishment, they do more against the law than they did before. Those are the un unrestrained and wicked who do evil wherever they have the opportunity. The rest become blind and arrogant. As has been said above about the scholastic theologians, they conceive the opinion that they are able to keep the law by their own powers. From this come the hypocrites and false saints. But the chief office or force of the law is to reveal original sin with all its fruit. It shows us how very low our nature has fallen, how we have become utterly corrupted. The law must tell us that we have no God, that we do not care for God, and that we worship other gods, something we would not have believed before and without the law. In this way we become terrified, humbled, depressed. We despair and anxiously want help, but see no escape. We begin to be an enemy of God and to complain, and so on. This is what Paul says, The law brings wrath. Sin is increased by the law. The law came in to increase the trespass. Article 3. Repentance The New Testament keeps and urges this office of the law as St. Paul does when he says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Also, the whole world may be accountable to God. No human being will be justified in his sight. Romans 3, 19 and 20. 
and Christ says the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin. This is God's thunderbolt. By the law, he strikes down both obvious sinners and false saints. He declares no one to be in the right, but drives them altogether to terror and despair. This is the hammer. As Jeremiah says, is not my word like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? This is not active contrition or manufactured repentance. It is passive contrition, true sorrow of the heart, suffering, and the sensation of death. This is what true repentance means. Here a person needs to hear something like this. You are all of no account, whether you are obvious sinners or saints in your own opinions. You have to become different from what you are now. You have to act differently than you are now acting, whether you are as great, wise, powerful, and holy as you can be. Here, no one is godly. But to this office of the law, the New Testament immediately adds the consoling promise of grace through the gospel. This must be believed. As Christ declares, repent and believe in the gospel, Mark 1.15. That is, become different, act differently, and believe my promise. John the Baptist, preceding Christ, is called a preacher of repentance, but this is for the forgiveness of sins. That is, John was to accuse all and convict them of being sinners. This is so they can know what they are before God and acknowledge that they are lost, so they can be prepared for the Lord, to receive grace and to expect and accept from him the forgiveness of sins. This is what Christ himself says, Repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in my name to all nations. Luke 24, 47. Whenever the law alone exercises its office without the gospel being added, there is nothing but death and hell, and one must despair as Saul and Judas did. 1 Samuel 31, Matthew 27, 5. St. Paul says, Through sin the law kills. Romans 7, 10. On the other hand, the gospel brings consolation and forgiveness. It does so not in just one way, but through the word and the sacraments and the like, as we will discuss later. As Psalm 130, verse 7 says, Against the dreadful captivity of sin, with the Lord is plentiful redemption. However, we now have to contrast the false repentance of the sophists with true repentance in order that they may be understood better. Tomorrow evening we will talk about the false repentance of the papists. And that will be as far as we will get tomorrow night. So tomorrow night, the false repentance of the papists. We now join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, merciful and holy Bridegroom, we grieve the fall of your church. It is our fault that the beauty of your bride is no longer recognized. Therefore we pray you, give and increase in us faith, love, and hope in you. Root out of us all sins and vice, all strife, all disbelief, all error and heresy. Rebuke the erring, convert the unbelievers. Bring the rebellious again to the unity of the Christian church, and show them the light of your truth. Protect our shepherd from all danger of body and soul. Bless all pastors and those who administer in the church in the building of your congregation. Grant them success in all things. Equip your whole church with the power and proof of the holy faith. Stand by your witnesses among the nations, and further the course of your gospel in all the world. Fill all government with the fear of you, and let their ruling serve to foster and preserve peace. Have mercy on our people and our country. Let the youth be brought up in discipline, and in a right knowledge of you. 
so that they may recognize your law and the way of your salvation. Give constancy and loyalty to all pious teachers. Comfort all the troubled and sorrowful. Impart health of body and soul to the sick. Grant to all pregnant women, according to your mercy, a happy result in their childbearing. To the needy give bodily and spiritually, according to your good pleasure. Let those who travel be commended to the protection of your holy angels, and be a strong help to all who need you. For the sake of your holy wounds, O Jesus. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, who in love has joined us to the precious body of your Son, Jesus Christ, in the water of holy baptism, grant that we may find peace and comfort in being incorruptible, even as he is incorruptible. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.